of 1940s. And it's a very interesting period because most of these people were born in the late 1800s and they became artists in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. And the early 1900s in the United States was a very interesting time. Um, it was a period of peace. It was a period of prosperity and progress. We were making widgets, we were manufacturing. Um, people were gravitating from the country to the city. Um, city dwellers um, averaged about 30 to 40% of the people in the United States. But there was something occurring with this. It began the disparity truly of rich and poor. Um, many middle-class individuals were able to take advantage of the advances in technology and manufacturing and the social uh, movements at the time. Um, rural people who came in and minorities ended up as the workers. They ended up um, in the sewing factories. They ended up in the manufacturing factories. And nearly one out of three um, people working in factories at the time were literally starving. So we had the stage set for the rest of that century, it appeared. Now, the artist at that time, by the time the 1940s came about, we had gone through the depression in 29, we had gone through World War II, and the artists at the time were split. They were realists or regionalists, and what that means is that they were painting nostalgic images of what America was, the landscape and churches and chicken dinners and people getting together, um, um, old elms on streets. But there was a movement that was coming together at the same time. The younger artists were saying, no, abstract is the way we should be going. Jackson Pollock was a contemporary of these artists. And if you know Jackson Pollock, he put his canvas on the floor and he dripped paint on it and said to his wife one day, is this art? So that was the stage that was set for these artists. So we're going to take a look at Edward Hopper, who was a realist, Andrew Wyeth, who was a realist, and then um, finally an African-American artist, um, Palmer Hayden, who has a very interesting background because he sits in the middle of what was called the Harlem Renaissance, and we'll talk about that as we get to the third one. So let's, since I set the stage for the historical period, let's take a look at Edward Hopper. Um, and I like to show the image of the artist because that helps you relate to the kind of work that they do. So while Priscilla's working on Edward Hopper, I'll tell you a little bit about his story. Um, he grew up in New York. Um, his mother was more of the artist. His father had a mercantile store, sold items, uh, but he was always interested in drawing. Um, and in his early 20s, he started to um, tr use charcoal and pencil. And really by the time he was in his mid 30s, he was selling his art to the Whitney Museum of Art and really making money. So he's one of the few artists who became well known during his lifetime. He was called a metaphysical realist. And what that means is that beginning in about 1910 in Italy, artists began to create dreamlike works with sharp contrasts of light and shadow. And um, Edward Hopper was a realist. He was um, not an idealist. He was conservative. He was so firmly grounded and very quiet within himself and did not really enjoy people, was more of an introvert. So this type of dreamlike work um, of light and shadow became his style throughout his life. Um, we can, his, his inspiration um, came from the people at the time and the industry at the time. It was railroads, it was lonely places, cafes, it was street scenes, um, um, more of the commonplace than the unique subject matter for himself. Um, the scene that we're gonna look at called Gas um, was derived from his wife and himself just traveling around his community 
around twilight trying to find a picture of a gas station that was lit from the top, but he couldn't find it because gas stations were conserving energy at the time and would wait until midnight to turn their lights on. So when we take a look at this picture, this painting of Edward Hopper's, it is a composite of several images he had in his mind of gas stations as he and his wife traveled around the Pennsylvania neighborhood. Um, um, if we can take a look at the painting now, and it's uh, one of the two famous paintings of Edward Hopper's, the others is called Nighthawks, but this one with gas is a very interesting and unique painting. And I'm curious to know, as we put this up on the screen, where your eye first goes as you look at this painting. And while it's coming up, um, I can talk a little bit about the composition in it. Um, it's a nighttime and the light um, is kind of directing you to gaze directly into the area of the pumps and the fluorescent light coming out of the building is harsh. Um, it's really difficult to talk until it's up. You should be able to see it, Kathy. Are you, is it not coming up on the... Okay. Let me no, start. I don't have it. I don't have okay. it up either. Priscilla, I don't have it up. Okay, bear with me one moment, everybody. I will get that for you. Okay, so let's go here. Huh. All right, how about that? Can you see it now? Yeah. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So before we begin talking about it, just run your eyes over this painting. And what is the first, what's the focal point for you? Any thoughts? Fire, looks like fire in back of him. The bushes look like fire. Fire? Back of the uh, man standing at the gas along there, the red looks like fire to me. Oh, it looks like fire to you. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe the red, the color red. The color red. Orange, more orange than red. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's nighttime. The light directs the gaze, kind of permeating the moment, throwing um, uh, a part of the painting in relief. The light from the building points directly to the gas station pumps. Um, the lone attendant is at dusk. It kind of creates a sense of drama. And for Hopper, um, he created his images in his painting as, all, uh, uh, as you were observing them, as though they were insignificant, just kind of lost within um, the situation of what they were involved in. Um, you're right, the red color, the pumps stand out while the background trees almost appear impenetrable. Um, the light is the main character of Hopper's paintings. It kind of covers and discovers people and buildings if you see the top of the, uh, the man's head. Um, it's glowing. In his paintings, people are absorbed by something. They are observed, as I mentioned, without being aware of it, almost secretly. So they're insignificant almost, yet significant at the same time. Um, there are a couple of uh, composition elements in the painting that draws our eye in. There's a definite horizon line at the top of the trees to the sky. There's a definite line broken by the pumps that lead you into the deep impenetrable forest, isn't there? Um, he um, creates um, or captures kind of a sense of, I think, loneliness of the American country road. Is that the feeling that you would get also? Mm -hmm. What other feeling do you think um, he's intending for you to experience as you look at this? Um, it kind of strikes me as going into the unknown from there, Kathy, just being mm -hmm. where you don't know where it's going. 
You don't know where it's going. Kind of solitude late at night. He captures loneliness. The highway apparently ends here, disappearing into the woods, and the edge of the woods rises like a big dark wall without any kind of individual tree being readily um, visible. And I would say, and it's often said, that this, this gas station appears as the last outpost, mm -hmm. kind of a realm where human meets nature. Do you get that feeling too? As though the last car passed a long time ago? And the, uh, mm -hmm. um, Hooper's paintings often represent a borderline between day and night, between civilization and nature. He captures that with light. Um, and isolation and loneliness is really um, a theme in Hopper's painting. That's kind of the backbone of his art. And one of the things as you look at this painting, it's kind of almost painful to look at. The eye shifts to the ribbon of the road leading out of the picture to the right. But then you come up around the building and you immediately want to leave around that building following the light in front of the building to escape. So you're moved around this painting, but there's a portal out and it's at the side of the building. Um, do you remember these gas pumps? Do you, Susan? Absolutely, absolutely. And you would go for miles and miles and miles. Beautiful countryside, farms, and then all of a sudden, boom, there was one of these. And one of these. Just, just one, and they always looked like they were abandoned, but they, and, and now they are, but um, they would have like one attendant there and they always pumped your gas. You didn't pump it. Um, right. yeah. mm -hmm. Very, uh, very much like I have seen. And it just captures it beautifully. It does. And do you recognize that red flying horse? Yeah. yeah. Flying A, yeah. <laughs> what kind of gas is that? Mobile. <laughs> Isn't it? Um, Little advertisement art. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, ask about his paintings, though. Um, <coughs> Hopper is quoted as saying, they talk about me. The picture's my inner, an immense floating ocean, a self-portrait in search of myself. All the answers are on the canvas. Something doesn't come out of nothing. I'm after me. And again, what happened is he was a fairly quiet man. Um, he and his wife would sit on a couch in a living room and he would stare out the window and she would stare out the ocean and they wouldn't really talk, but they had a kind of communion with one another. He was a very introspective man, um, just caught up in the social times, struck by um, how isolated people felt in the midst of all this progress. And he tried to capture this feeling of people sitting alone, being alone amidst a crowd. Um, um, his paintings are full of loneliness, as you mentioned, solitude. And believe it or not, there's anxiety in it. It's unrestful. There's a contradiction. Hmm. And the observer kind of, we're kind of forced to exit the safety zone as he points us out of the picture and leads us away. I don't know if you want to go down that road. Well, you certainly don't want to stay there. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, Hopper is really well known internationally and he's really loved within um, the, um, the artists in America and I think because he has a very unique style. Um, he avoided the contemporary push to um, experiment with cubism and to experiment with abstract and there are a few artists we have who captured the feeling of the time they were social artists. They were realists, and we soon lost many of the realists to abstract expressionalism by the time the mid-50s came. Um, the artists just simply wanted to reflect what was inside of them versus what they saw. Um, so 
Edward Hopper is um, kind of one of the quintessential realist painters of uh, the 1900s in America. Um, and the next one we look at, Andrew Wyeth, is his contemporary. Now this painting is done in 1948, Christina's World, and I know you know this, um, Priscilla mentioned she used to have a copy of this in the, in the um, dorm room, and many kids, we all had copies of Christina's World. Um, when we take a look at Andrew Wyeth, um, his father was an illustrator and illustrated um, many well-known books at the time. He was a perfectionist, he had five children, and he guided all of his children in terms of what their potential was and what they expressed, and they all expressed an interest in art. So Andrew Wyeth has a sister who's a painter and a brother who's a painter, a son who's a painter. They all worked within um, his father's studio. Very early, Andrew Wyeth became a quite accomplished illustrator and would illustrate for his father, and um, his father's name would be on the illustrations. Um, he is classified as a realist painter, um, in sharp contrast to the other painters at the time. His favorite subjects were the land and the people around him, both in his hometown of Chadsforth, Pennsylvania, and then where they had a summer home in Cushing, Maine. And virtually all of the hundreds of paintings that Wyeth did are from those two areas. Now, um, excuse me, I'm looking at Ho Hopper's face on my screen. Well, let me do this, Francis. It's the bottom picture is Wyeth. There's two pictures in the bottom one. I see. Okay. okay. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Wyeth's painting changed in about 1945. And again, Christina's World is um, painted in 1948. Um, Wyeth was um, a great student of his father as well as had a great relationship with his father. And his father and three-year-old nephew were caught on the train uh, uh, track and killed in 1945. And it was at that time, if you look at the paintings before and after, that you'll see that Andrew Wyeth's tone became muted earth tone, brown, much more subdued. Um, it was quite a tragic experience for him and changed his life. Um, now, this woman is Christina Olson. And it happened in um, Wyatt's youth, um, when while visiting in Cushing, Cushing Maine, that he um, knocked on a fellow artist door and met the daughter of the artist who became Betsy Wyeth. And Betsy Wyeth um, took Andrew Wyeth around the pencil or the main area and introduced him to her friend, Christina Olson and her brother who lived in this farmhouse, 18th century farmhouse. So they became, they all became great friends and it would be a 30 year friendship that Andrew Wyeth had with Christina Olson and her brother to the point where he's buried in the same cemetery with them per his request. So many, many paintings of Andrew Wyeth's involve Christina Olson. Um, the Olson family home is on the National um, Registry for Historic Places in Maine. Um, this painting, in 1948 was purchased by the Museum of Modern Art almost when it was finished, almost a month after it was finished for $1,800. Um, was immediately put in the museum, so it didn't have the kind of notoriety or exposure because it was purchased so soon once it was created. Um, Wyeth used egg tempera, and that's using the yolk of an egg with pigment and the reason he chose it is because he could control um, very carefully his grass, his um, subject matter. And in this scene, um, it's a little bit more blurred, but if we had a, a really a top-notch image, you could literally see the spikes of grass underneath the, um, or in the field. So let's take a look at Christina's world. Um, 
In this painting, where's your eye drawn? Uh, mine goes right to Christina, I think, initially. To the scene? Well, to, to Christina herself and then drawn to the farmhouse where she's looking, I think. Mm -hmm. I Is that right? I see the farmhouse first. Yeah, me too. So what we have is a treeless, treeless field up to the barn. He uses angles and his mastery of light to help us. Do you see the triangles in this painting? Where are the triangles? Well, maybe that patch of shorter grass um, comes to a point. It doesn't really look like a triangle though. The roofs, actually the roofs of the house, the buildings are definitely and the, the house and the small outhouse along the base forms a big triangle, all three of them. Mm -hmm. And of course the shed does, but there's also a patch of grass under yeah. Christina that takes us up to the, up to the um, buildings. And there are actually three models here. The figures, um, wasted limbs and pink dress belong to Christina, who was 50, and Andrew Wyeth made hundreds of sketches of her hands and her legs and the contour of her body before he painted this. And the youthful head and torso is Betsy Wyeth, his wife, who modeled, and she's in her 20s. So you have the bottom half, Christina Wilson, Christina Olson in her 50s, and the upper half, of Betsy Wyeth, his wife, and probably the most famous would be the home in many ways, which was preserved um, and uh, really built in the 1700s. The composition is asymmetrical, but balanced. Now, what does that mean? Yeah, it's off. It's off, but it's balanced. The line of Christina's um, body points you directly up to that home and anchors her. But if you take a look objectively at the painting, it's off. Mm -hmm. The space to the left is very wide compared to the shed in the home, um, but it works. Um, it's a, the style of painting um, is called, according to the Museum of Modern Art, magic realism, where everyday scenes are kind of a, imbued with a poetic mystery. And Andrew Wyeth was, uh, was adept at creating kind of a poetic mystery in his paintings. Um, he captured Christina because she was picking blackberries along the side of the hillside and crawling her back up to the um, home. And he was um, painting in his studio on the third floor of that house. When he became friends with Christina and her brother, um, they visited frequently and Christina gave him the third story where he painted for 30 years. And he would watch her climbing up this hill um, to the house. She refused a wheelchair and she climbed or crawled on her um, legs her entire life around the farm. Um, wow. Oh my goodness. Oh. When you take a look at this, knowing that she's crawling to the farmhouse, um, you can appreciate why Wythe used a low angle on the scene and painted the grass to look like an endless sea creating um, an effect of distance between Christina and the house. Okay. You see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just goes on forever. That's masterful to create this sense of perspective. You are her eyes. Wow. Um, in a, if we were to look at this painting in real life, the detail in the grass is incredibly um, clear and helps give this illusion of um, depth as he works with his color. Individual hairs of blade, blades and hairs and blades of grass are kind of painstakingly highlighted. And again, it is a perfectly asymmetrical, balanced painting, which is hard to do. Um, and the the um, wagon wheels lines in that 
in that hillside take you right up to the house also. The fence line around the house draws your eye in. Wyeth said he was painting a person who was horrifically crippled, but that he wanted to make sure that this was not a painting specifically about a crippled person, that it was a painting about and a way about aspiration, because he greatly admired Christina for her ability to not let her handicap, which was some kind of muscular um, um, disease, not let her handicap prevent her from living her life to the fullest. He said, it's a shock for me to go through and see all those years of my life painting. When I made these paintings, I was lost in trying to capture moments and emotions that were taking place. And it's a very difficult thing for an artist to look back at his work if it's personal. It touches all of these emotions. And really, when Zayef um, was finished painting Christina's world, he took it to his home and put it above his couch and looked at his wife and said, this is a flat tire. He just, he just couldn't see, he couldn't, he couldn't step back and see the value in what it was about. Um, so this painting conveys melancholy, kind of uh, a sentimental impression um, of uh, really the outward expression of Wyatt's grief because his father had just passed away three years before and his paintings after 1945 kind of portray an emptiness, a loneliness and a, and a, a feeling of wanting, of isolation, um, of melancholy. Um, this painting is again in the Museum of Modern Art it had been loaned out only once to a museum in Pennsylvania. Despite the request for it being loaned, um, or request for a loan, um, the Museum of Modern Art does not loan it out, stating that it's too fragile to travel. Um, um, and it is an iconic painting, wouldn't you say? Something that most Americans could just recognize if they didn't know who painted it, they would certainly say, yes, I've seen it somewhere. I know, I always think I always thought that, not always thought, but when someone first tried to tell me the story of the painting, um, I thought that she was stranded, that she had, I knew she was crippled, but that she had um, maybe fallen or couldn't get back to the house. So hearing you tell the story of how she got around the farm by crawling, um, gives me so much more an impression of strength from her um, and not, but when you talk about the desperate, you know, isolation and desperation, you definitely see, that's what I was maybe seeing before that. Right, uh, right, is, and the, the, go ahead. Is the painting fragile because of the use of the egg yolks? I think so, right. Um, um, and I, I'm, I should check to see what he painted it on, but I think also um, the canvas itself has been repaired several times. So with light, with, uh, with the air, um, it's most of these paintings um, rotate within museums where they're kept in an environment that's controlled and then brought out and then returned and then brought out. Um, but we know quite a bit about this painting because it's the, it's the policy of the Museum of Modern Art to send a questionnaire to living artists of the paintings and of the art they acquire. So Andrew Wyeth shared quite a bit about what this painting was about simply because he was a living artist at the time that Amoma acquired it. And that's how we know that um, he caught Christina struggling up this hill as he looked out that third story window painting one day and it affected him. Not so much her crippledness as Priscilla was saying, but as her about her strength that she did not let this inability to get around stop her from crawling and moving all over this farm and that's how she got around so it's um 
It's a very interesting perspective since he looked at her from the house down and he painted her from down on the grass up. Wow. <clears throat> that so grass is, looks like anything but comfortable. Right. It just <laughs> looks prickly, it looks dry, it looks uncomfortable to even be sitting there. Mm -hmm. Let yeah. moving through it. If you have a chance to go online to take a look at um, a good reproduction, and it's hard, the depth and the color and the tonality and the sense of movement is very um, um, skillfully done in this painting. Has anyone ever seen this painting at the Museum of Modern Art? Don't know. Have you been there? No. No. We should all see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. why would he have painted um, her body from two different subjects? He said that the torso was, the top part I think was his wife's and the bottom part was Christina. I don't know, but I'm going to find that out. Um, it just, um, I... Most of the information available just indicates that there were really two models. That Christina Olson's um, hips and legs were the bottom part, and that his wife modeled for him the top part. And it could, I'll check, but it could very well be that in capturing this twisted torso, he really did need a model to be able to bend and twist to capture that movement but you know judy that's a really good question let's see if we can find out why did he choose to have two models for christina's world you get the, the other question. thing that stresses me is her dress and the staining not you know first i didn't pay attention but her hand and the dress and her socks if she's in that blueberry patch or whatever that she's got the stain from from working with the berries so her arms look so thin. They look so thin. Um, and I often thought, why did he capture her in a pink dress? As if she crawls along the ground. Yeah. Did you right. wonder that? Yeah, I, I'm thinking that was that why is she I guess a dress would be right for that era. Right. She wouldn't be in pants, but um you'd think that would be a dark color rather than a light color. Especially for berry picking. Right. And a little bit more substantial than just cotton. Right. Yeah. Right. But it, it's a very moving painting. You just empathize with what yes. this woman is going through and how isolated she feels, and you want someone to come help her. But that is not Christina Olson. She was a very strong willed woman and lived with, along with her brother in that home throughout her entire life. And she would cook and she'd move around the kitchen and around her home crawling. Wow. Yeah, that's something. Well, let's move on to the third and final of our artists for this session. And um, it's a black artist, an African American artist um, named Palmer Hayden. And our period now is about 1918 to the mid 1930s. Um, a great migration took place after the Emancipation Proclamation at the end of the 1800s of the African American to Chicago, to New York area, out of the oppressive South to the more accepting North. Um, and that's when Harlem started in the early 1920s and 30s. Um, it was a golden age for American artists, writers, and musicians. Um, it gave artists pride and the control over their Black experience um, and represented African American culture. It also set the stage for the Civil Rights Movement. So it was a very important time um, for the Black American here in the United States. It created notable people such as Dubois, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington was part of that era, Cab Calloway, um, and many um, African-American artists that became involved in the um, WPA project, you know, the US um, uh, Treasury Art Project 
uh, during the Depression, of which um, Palmer Hayden was an artist, and he painted scenes of New York waterfront and other local subjects. So this period, called the Harlem Art Renaissance, is the period where um, Palmer Hayden uh, started painting. He um, was one of 12 children, grew up on the banks of the Potomac River, he was inspired by his older brother to begin drawing as a child. He really wanted to be a fiddler, but he couldn't afford the lessons and the painting um, was, was easier and more readily available for him. So that was the, um, the um, path in life he actually chose over musicians, over becoming a musician. Um, Living in New York, he was in the midst of this artistic kind of cultural burgeoning African American society where where there was community support, where there was um, encouragement. Booker T. Washington at that time in, um, inspired and urged um, the literary African literary giants we have from there, the musicians um, created places for them to perform and to present. So Hayden had a lot of support in terms of his artistry um, and his talent that he um, developed. He, he focused on African American folk art, on urban life in um, Harlem, and the rural South. He, he depicted black subjects kind of in unguarded daily routines and his uh, characterizations were sometimes frowned upon because he did capture more of the um, uh, elaborate facial features and, and put people, put black people into compromising situations, but it was really their life that he was capturing. Um, he was self-taught, um, eventually ended up winning or um, uh, art, uh, painting uh, competition um, monies from various uh, competitions that he entered enough uh, so that he was able to go to Paris and um, train or learn under several artists in Paris. And then he returned back to New York in the mid thirties. Um, his style is of uh, the African-American folk art. He preferred scenes of people over these landscapes that he would paint, and he wanted to capture and record for posterity the life of the Black American in uh, the Harlem environment during that time. So if we take a look at the painting that we're gonna look at today of Palmer Hayden, it's called The Janitor Who Paints um, and done in 1939, 1940. So again, all of these artists, um, Hopper and Andrew Wyeth and Palmer Hayden are contemporaries. Um, realism is fading. Abstract expressionalism is gaining popularity but there are a group of artists who captured society at the time and um, Palmer Hayden captured African-American society at the time. So let's just take a look at this painting quickly before we delve into it. And let's just say, where does your eye go? What are you looking at in this painting? I, think, I went right to the baby's eyes um, because uh, they look so strange. Mm -hmm. Now, the soft background light shines through um, and the mother and child is a classic composition from classic art. The Madonna and child mm has -hmm. purposely done by Palmer Hayden, because at the time he was a janitor supporting himself in his art and referred to as a janitor, not an artist. Mm -hmm. So inside this painting, there's some symbolism where he is saying, I can be called an artist, not a janitor. He uses the composition 
of the his wife and child in the typical Madonna and child um, um, position, essentially saying, I understand classic art. Also in the back of him are his genitorial um, tool that allow him to work, paint. And the, the pale. And the pale. Mm -hmm. um, brushes share the space with a bed and a nightstand. It's a very small space, but you get the feeling it's cozy. The clock alludes to the workman's schedule. It's very big, isn't it? Yes, that's what drew my eye first was the clock. Mm -hmm. He incorporated the beret on his head. Oh, I have seen it. And the subject of mother and child reinforces this sense of artistic identity. Um, one of the characteristics of, Ameri of a folk art that's very much Palmer Hayden's is the oversized hands and the intense cartoon-like expressions. Um, and he treats the space, he treats the items with relatively flat areas of color. Um, it, for example, the pant leg and the, leg, the legs of, of his wife and the back of the cat. Mm -hmm. They're simplified forms of American folk art. <coughs> and he really developed this um, style in his youth and carried it through throughout his life, despite the fact that he, um, his paintings look quite different after his experience in Paris, where he um, developed skill and capacity and understanding about composition and how to render um, uh, different tonalities in art. Um, um, in many ways, um, the composition here, which is prior to his training in Paris, does show perspective. He is in the foreground, the woman and the child are in the background, and then you have the bed which recedes further he is using darker colors in the foreground, which brings the picture forward and then has a muted tones way in the background by the bed, which helps the picture recede into the background. Um, he said, um, He said, what I want you to look at in the paintings I do is I decided to paint to support my love of art rather than have art support me. And this is more of a self-portrait. It's a, it's a protest painting and it's regarded as such by um, the museum curator and art critics that it is a protest painting. It's a statement on adversity. I can be an artist. Regard me as an artist, not as a janitor. Um, he, um, he, he wanted to be regarded as a professional artist rather than someone who painted his family and neighbors and the community in his spare time. But he was forced to support himself through um, becoming a janitor and other jobs um, to be able to to be able to paint and to support his family. He had taken odd jobs, including house cleaning and work in factory and janitor jobs. And, and he really didn't become um, a well-known artist until later in his lifetime. Any thoughts about this painting based on that kind of description of this being American folk art for the time for the African American. Now remember, his contemporary is Wyeth, it's Edward Hopper, but this is in Harlem. Well, it, it, the flatness of it, how you mentioned the folk art aspect, it does remind you of those colonial paintings um, where the right. characters are so flat and their expressions are so stiff um, and the big eyes and um, you definitely get that so is he maybe trying to draw that parallel between 
you know, being early Americans and being, you know, um, not necessarily pioneers, but being original. Those baby, go ahead. Those baby eyes. Me. <laughs> the baby. Baby's eyes. Oh yeah, they capture you, don't they? I agree. Kathy, I see the humbleness of his home. You know, the bare light bulbs, the, the pipes nice. uh, from the ceiling, um, right. the clock, the, you know, the, the, wear, the bare wood floors and everything does seem cozy, but it also seems very cramped. And, um, you know, it, it really does speak about how they lived. And, you know, it's, it's very touching. That's very good. Uh -huh. It cuts with their dress like how he's in he's wearing a tie and she's pretty dressed up with her heels on and all of that her fingernails are polished and so ah. I, I thought that it's Amazing. interesting and that first picture that priscilla showed um where it, i guess that was him painting at the waterfront he was dressed in a suit or a sports coat or something and would that be how artists would naturally dress during that time i think so you don't think so susan well, I don't think if they were painting at home, but I know my grandfather at that time never went to, and they lived in Pennsylvania in the, the summers were very humid and no air conditioning. And he always wore a three piece suit wow. and a starched collar. He never was without it. And wow. my dad, even in the forties and fifties, he would not go to the table except in a, a buttoned up white shirt. He would take his jacket off, but that was his only concession. So men did dress uncomfortably. Well, if you remember, if this is a protest painting, um, visual artists, not just Palmer Hayden, at this time during the Harlem Renaissance, like dramatists, like um, musicians, attempted to win control over their representation of their people from white caricature had, right. um, while developing their own image. So when you look at this, and he's in a suit and tie, he's essentially saying, um, I have value, I'm an artist. And he's wearing the beret, which is very French, which is right. very, like, I brought right. that back with yeah. me. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the figures, to me, look like cutouts. There, there seems to be a, a delineation around the images that make them, like, really not part of that scene, that they are oh. just placed there. Interesting. Because I don't see shadows from my, I see shadows, but those those pieces could just be removed and still be, but there's a line around all of the image, and it looks like it's just pasted on there. It's not, but that's just the image that I get. Yeah. I, think, I think the pin on her dress is very interesting. I wouldn't wear that pin if I was taking care of a baby. When you enlarge <laughs> But this is a dress up time, wouldn't you say, if you were po if they're posing yes. for this painting? And I think it's very interesting that it's a self portrait of his wife, his child and himself. So did he have a mirror? How did he capture the essence Amen. looking at himself mm -hmm. and at the scene? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. I'm curious about the painting of the cat on the wall and the cat in the foreground. Like, why, if you're a serious artist, Over there. which he was, and the painting you depict on your wall um, is a cat, like a part of a cat, I think. That's oh, yeah. Looks like, that looks like a cat. Yeah. yeah. Can, you please spell, can you spell his last name, please? I don't know if I have it correct. H A Y D E N. Um, and when we, in the closing of this, um, just one final comment. Um, for those of us who do attempt to paint or to draw, um, Palmer Hayden was really a quite accomplished artist, despite our understanding that this might be primitive art or folk art. Because if you look 
at his perspective, if you look at the vertical and horizontal lines where he accurately gives us the information to know that there's a bedroom behind, that the, we are in a foreground room, and that the perspective is correct. His angles are correct. The panels in the floor going back into the room are correct. So he, he, um, has, um, he's, he has a, a skill to capture despite the, um, the folk art feeling, um, a convincing experience of looking into multiple rooms. Now, one of the things you might do, and I mentioned this to Priscilla, in 1944, for 10 years, Palmer Hayden painted a series of 12 paintings called The Ballad of John Henry. Um, it's a series of paintings depicting scenes from the life of this legendary African-American um, folk hero, John Henry with the hammer in his hand, from a child, an infant in his mother's arms, all the way to where he lay um, dying um, in, this, um, in this work area with a hammer in his hand. These, the series of 12 paintings is at the Museum of African American Art in Los Angeles. And you can go online and just look up Museum of African American Art Los Angeles and just page through um, those 12 paintings of Palmer Hayden um, that he painted towards the end of his life because he has taken this primitive folk art um, and told the story of this African-American hero in just a beautiful rendition of the life cycle. Um, so, so it's a very good kind of gallery walk or museum walk of the Palmer Hayden's paintings. But this one, the janitor who paints, um, was a protest piece stating, um, I'm good, I'm an artist. I might support myself as a janitor, um, but he certainly created a place for himself during the uh, Harlem Renaissance as a painter of prestige throughout his entire life. So that really concludes the three paintings for today. Do you have any thoughts? No? Well, <laughs> let me unmute everybody. There we go. Um, you know, what's really interesting, I mean, it's all interesting, but I think the difference in perspective between um, Edward Hopper and Andrew Wyeth, who were sort of out in the countryside and depicting that isolation and ruralness, and then Palmer Hayden, who's very urban, um, just giving you a whole different point of view. And whole different. Coming from different places, but at the same time. Right. Right, and um, uh, to give the whole retro, to the whole perspective included in here, should be some really very abstract pieces of um, um, Kadinsky and uh, Pollock, because they were experimenting. Yeah. And they were not concerned with realism at all. They yeah. wanted to break away from. Um, from the earth, from natural environments, from people. Um, so it's very, I think, very good that we had a few artists left in the mid 1900s who said, well, we will capture what life is like. So I think you're right. Hayden um, and Hopper did that, as well as um, uh, Andrew Wyeth, who has some incredible paintings also. But they're all, they all reflect what's inside them. Right. So, thank you very much. This is um, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. We thank have one excited. more series. Hello. One more series next week um, that we'll wrap up. And it's taking a look at um, how artists painted members of their family and families. We'll take a look at three paintings. Huh. So, have so, a wonderful week. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Bye.